In the 1960s, a famous theologian was delivering a series of academic lectures here in America. This was an esteemed professor of theology. And as is the case in many of these conferences, there was a time for question and answer. During one of these sessions, the following question was presented. Doctor, what is the greatest thought that has ever passed through your mind? The esteemed professor paused for some time before raising his head to say, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. John 3.16 has been called everybody's favorite text, and for good reason. For in one unforgettable sentence, the entire gospel is summarized. One of the Protestant reformers tagged John 3.16 as the Bible in miniature. Few passages have had the eternal impact that this single God-breathed verse has. How many of you have committed this verse to memory? I know it's more than those who raised their hand. Would you say it with me? John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Despite our familiarity with John 3.16, I, I want to ask a follow-up question. How many times have you heard this verse preached in its actual context? Not cited in a sermon, not a drop-in evangelistic message, but you've been studying maybe at a church, this church, another church, Bible study fellowship, or you've been in a place where the entire gospel of John was, was being studied verse by verse, chapter by chapter. I would imagine we have not studied this passage in its context very often. And I'm not saying that that means that you haven't gotten the overarching point of the passage. I'm sure and trust you have. But I, I do know that that does mean that you have no doubt missed some of the glorious riches that are here in John 3.16. And with God's help, I hope to highlight some of those omissions here this morning and next. And really what I'm trying to point out here in the beginning is that one of the most common mistakes when studying the Bible on our own or even when we are listening to modern day preaching is to launch into any given passage without first understanding and establishing the context. That is Bible study principles 101, context, context, context. So let's establish the context and then dive into the, the text and see what God has for us here today. You recall that this passage is part of a conversation that Jesus is having with Nicodemus. Here in John chapter 3, at least the first half, the Apostle John is summarizing Nick at night's encounter with Jesus. In the opening 10 verses, Jesus shows Nicodemus that without a spiritual heart transplant, without the internal cleansing of the Holy Spirit, without a miraculous new birth from above, that he and everyone else cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He stuns a person who might have been the most religious person on the planet with these words, you, yes, even you, must be born again. For a religious individual that's nearly reached the pinnacle of human achievement, Jesus' evangelistic sermon is absolutely devastating. I can guarantee to you that if Jesus were to have a discussion with the Roman Catholic Pope, that his message would very likely include that which he said to Nicodemus. Yes, even you, implication, you're not yet saved. You, yes, even you, need a new heart. If regeneration is the Spirit's doing, and verse 6 says that it certainly is, 
That means that everything that Nicodemus has done in effort to merit favor with God is actually worthless. Because without a new heart, without this spiritual new birth from above, this miraculous and mysterious work of the Holy Spirit, wherein God takes those of us who are sinners, all of us, where he takes those who are dead in their trespasses and sin and breathes life in their spiritual dry bones, to use the imagery of Ezekiel 36 and 37, wherein God does the miracle of salvation, wherein he makes us alive, those of us who are dead in our trespasses and sin. Nicodemus, you have been striving to be the best you, following the the religion of, of Pharisaic Judaism. You've ascended to the top of the spiritual totem pole, And yet you lack that which you need most. This is a wake-up call for all who are religious and not yet saved. Nicodemus is being told that without a new heart, everything he's done for God means nothing. That, of course, becomes the testimony of a Pharisee turned Christian. The Apostle Paul says, if you want to brag about your religious background... I will exceed you. Look at my birth. Look at what family I was raised in. Circumcised on the eighth day. A Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. As of zeal according to the law, humanly speaking, blameless. And then Paul says, by the grace of God, the Lord showed him that all of that was worthless. And what he found was something of surpassing value. That was the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ that is imputed, that is transferred, that is credited only to those who repent of their sins and place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I've done that, and I've come to find that all that I was living for is worthless, and everything that I found in Christ is of value beyond measure. It not only holds promise to this life, but for the life to come. This is the gospel message with a heavy emphasis on God's sovereignty that Jesus brings to Nicodemus under the cover of darkness. The question then is, how does Nicodemus respond to Jesus? He responds to Jesus the way most religious unbelievers respond to Jesus. Initially, not very well. Have you noticed this, friend? Have you noticed that self-righteous moralists can oppose the gospel more than a godless pagan? You might be preaching to somebody in the LGBT community. They might not listen to your message or believe it, but, but many times you talk to somebody who favors, who, who, who believes himself to be a, a good person, and if you preach the pure gospel of grace, the message of Jesus, the message of John 3.16, it is them who find it that we be often more offended and in some cases more hostile. Notice Nicodemus' response. We pick up the action in verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said to Jesus, John chapter 3, we continue. If you're not there, please turn. John chapter 3, verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said to Jesus, how can these things be? He's dazed. He's astonished. He's amazed. We shouldn't be surprised because the biblical gospel is so seldom preached in all of its fullness that some people, even religious people, even a theologian in, in, in whatever church you're speaking of, says, I don't even understand this. But Jesus says to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Jesus is not impressed. If you can't get the message of salvation right, what's going to come of all of your followers? Verse 11, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak that which we know and bear witness of that which we have seen, and yet you people do not receive our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, even the Son of Man. What does Jesus have to do with salvation? Verse 14, and as Moses in the Old Testament lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Last week's exposition of verses 11 through 15, for those of you who missed it, can be summarized in three words. Listen, look, and live. And that is the foundation for which we come to John 3.16. Look at the text with me if you would. 
My concern for you is the same concern I have for myself. We're so familiar, we're so familiar with the message, but with what we think we know and what we do know, that we will not be astonished and amazed as we ought. God help us as we study now his word. How does John 3.16 begin? Where does Jesus go next? For God... Stop right there. This word for is very instructive. In the original Greek text, there are actually two words. Kutas gar. Translated in most English texts as for. And it's a good translation. This is an explanatory conjunction. In other words, Jesus will be answering some unspoken thoughts. The question that should arise upon thinking about the sovereign work of God and regeneration and the human responsibility to respond to the message of the gospel, the message of Christ and faith, and is this. Why? I told you, sadly, even many Christians, when they hear about God's sovereign, mysterious, and marvelous work of regeneration, we who are dead, God making us alive together with Christ, for by grace we've been saved, that many people ask the question, why? But they ask the wrong why question. They ask, why not everybody? We look around us, and the real question that we should be asking is, why, why me? Why any of us? The question here that will be answered is, why is there a plan of salvation to begin with? Why did God save you? You who believe. You who are born again by the Holy Spirit. You who have faith in Jesus Christ. Said differently, I'm not simply talking today about what happened, the historical perfect life substitutionary death, bodily resurrection of Christ, the cornerstone of the Christian faith, the gospel of, of grace, the only message under heaven given among men by which men must be saved, Acts 4.12. We're not simply here talking about the what, we're talking more about the why. What motivated this glorious and costly plan of redemption? Why did Jesus come to this earth, the eternal Son of God, take on flesh and dwell among us? Well, he came, he lived to die, verse 14 just said. Look at this passage in its context. Even so, just like Moses raised a serpent in the wilderness, whoever looked on it in faith were, were, were healed physically, just so it is, the Son of Man must come and be lifted up on the cross so that whoever, whoever would believe on him would have eternal life and be saved. Why in the world would God choose to save anyone at the expense that is mentioned here in verses 14 and following? And the answer we receive is out of this world, crazy, amazing. How are we to understand salvation, God's gracious and miraculous work. Only God can save sinners from their sin. It is a miracle. The answer is given to us in an economy of words that only the Holy Spirit could do. For God, there's the explanatory clause, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God's love for the sinful world of men is the first cause, the source, and the stated reason for Christmas, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. We have those holidays to celebrate, 
to rejoice in and marvel over only because of God and because of who God is and because of what this loving God was willing to do. You could translate John 3.16 this way. In love, the Father God gave the Son of His everlasting love. Again, when you look at this passage in its original context, you, you'll find that in the original Greek text, the main verb agape is placed ahead of the subject. What that means for you is that divine love is the main thrust of John 3.16, that the Son of God is calling us today to, to look at, behold, marvel at, meditate upon the divine love of God. If there is a theme that God's people should never tire of hearing, it's this one. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. For those who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ who are seeking to receive this message through the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit, surely your hearts will be warmed and stirred within you, drawn to the foot of the Savior's cross, drawn up to heaven as we behold not simply the glory and power of God, but here specifically the love of God. The saints and angels never grow tired of singing, of meditating on thinking of the love of God in Christ. Love is a, is, is a message you hear over and over again in a political season with such division, such hatred, such animosity. You hear some talking about love. It's just not the kind of love that's spoken of here. You turn on the radio, you hear about love. Much of that love is contaminated with sensuality and other things. But some of the songs even written by unbelievers is marveling at or at least saying you know, how much we all desperately want to experience love, to be loved and to love. Love your neighbor. Love for your wife, love for your husband, love for your children, love for your friend. You say, well, what's so, what's so exceptional? What's so special? What's so marvelous? What's so unique about God's love? Come take a look with me as we study John 3.16. This passage, this beloved verse highlights for us five different dimensions of God's love. So the overarching thrust of John 3.16 is God's love. Here we will break it down into the five different dimensions of divine love. In your notes, you'll note that we will see, firstly, we will look at the nature of God's love. I'm going to show you what's different about God's love, what's extraordinary about God's love, what's better, how God's love is better, pure, deeper, wider. We will look at the nature of God's love. Secondly, we will consider the scope of God's love. Thirdly, we will look at the purpose of God's love. Fourthly, we will consider the results of God's love. And fifthly, we will consider the pulpit of God's love. Now, let me say that again because some of you say, I only wrote down number one. We will look at the nature, scope, purpose, results, and pulpit of God's love. And you say, what is the goal? That's what you're going to do, or that's what you're saying. This is where we're headed. You're giving us a roadmap. Why? What's, what, what's the end game? I want to highlight these five dimensions with you to the end. Here's what I'm aiming at. Here's what I believe God would, would be blessed. Here's what I believe God would desire. Here's a way that God would be honored through the proclamation of this text. I am going to highlight these dimensions with you to the end that lost sinners might in faith receive God's love gift and be saved. That you would behold the beauty of the Lord while looking at the love of God in Christ and that you would be so blown away by it, so moved by it, so that you would, as it were, reach out to the loving Lord and receive the free gift of salvation in Jesus Christ. 
For those of you who already believe, for those of you who have already experienced Calvary's love, my prayer is that we, the redeemed, might live our lives in the sphere of God's transcendent love. Stay with me because after talking about the nature of God's love, I'm going to highlight some of the practical implications, but we need to understand the nature of it before we move into application. So let's now then look at, firstly, and we only have time this morning to look at one. We'll finish the rest, Lord willing, next week. But let's unpack the first dimension of God's love. Number one, let's consider the nature of God's love. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. This is a, a very simple deduction, one that is often overlooked, or one in which somebody doesn't consider the practical ramifications of. This passage, Jen, since we're talking about God and his love under the banner of salvation, generation, we're told then that the author of salvation is the father of love. The person who came up with the plan, the idea, the one who executed the plan and brings it to fruition is the father of love. Beloved, that is an awesome truth claim. It is a truth claim that is often questioned. It is a question, it is, a question it, is a, it is an issue that is often doubted. Many people today believe that God is great, but he's apparently not very good. Just listen to them talk about God. They don't question his greatness, his power. but they question his love. Still others, I see even in sometimes in Christian circles, sometimes we have a breakdown in the family where there's a, you know, the good cop parent and the bad cop parent. And that's not very loving, is it? Is that what happens in the Trinity? Is Jesus the good cop and the father the bad cop? Worse yet, Catholics tell people, why do they pray to Mary? Why so much of the faith about Mary? Forget the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and the Virgin Mary. Why? Catholics tell people to look to Jesus' earthly mother. God is holy and just, austere, too harsh. Oh, but Jesus, the loving Son, will never, he will never not listen to the pleas of his mother Mary. She's the approachable one. Doctrine and theology is life. Bad doctrine and bad theology leads to all kinds of unwise and in some cases sinful practices. Against such errors, the Bible reminds us of this, that the God of the Bible, here specifically the Father, by nature is a God of perfect love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. We know what God did. And we're being told here that God by nature is a loving God. In other words, God loves because he is love. We love God, not because we by nature are loving people. We love God, why? Because he first loved us. Never forget it. We can love one another as we ought to a degree, in a sense, solely because of the love of God for us. John 3.16 says, for God so loved. Those of you who study the Bible for any period of time realize that there are three Greek words used for love, different characteristics of love expressed. This here is the agape form. For God so agaped 
the world. You say, what is agape love about? Agape love describes that which is selfless and costly. We're really tested in our love for one another, if I can bring it back down to the human plane for a moment, just to, so we can marvel at this kind of love that God would have for us, the creator for the creature, the holy for the sinful. Oh, I love you so much. Then why aren't you willing to help out with the dishes? Oh, I love you so, so, so much. Then why aren't you willing to t- turn, put your cell phone down and just listen? Agape love describes that which is selfless and costly. Those are obviously, <laughs> that's a pretty small cost and we struggle with it and fail. The intensity of, of God's love is magnified here in the grammatical construction of John 3.16. Therefore, it is only fitting to praise not just the love of God, but we speak of the deep, deep love of God. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Oh, the the deep, deep love of God the, the Father. Oh, the height, breadth, length, width of God's love. Oh, we, we, we speak of love. Some of us have knows what it is to, to be loved and how sweet it is to even be loved by somebody who, who doesn't always love perfectly. That's all of us. Certainly none of us who can love the way that God can love. The love of God that is being spoken of here, the nature of God's love, is great. When we think about salvation, we can't help but think of, well... It, it, it flows from the heart of God and God who by nature is love. And so Paul says in Ephesians 2, 4, because of his great love, not just his love, his great love with which he loved us. When speaking of God's love different than ours, we say God's love is immeasurable. Paul basks in the light of that love in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. To what degree did God love the world? Look at the text. For God, so we should really put there a bunch of O's. For God so loved the world. A world that is perishing in sin, mind you. For God so loved the world to such an extent that he gave his only begotten son. Aren't you glad that the bottomless well of God's love runs so much deeper than ours? The love that is depicted in Scripture isn't just warm, fuzzy feelings plastered on a Hallmark card. Love is far more than a feeling. The love that is spoken of here is expressed in action words, verbs. Love is a verb. Gave is a verb. The generous love of God, according to those who have experienced it and who are told to write of it, like Paul in 2 Corinthians 9.15, God's love is indescribable. And here, what we are seeing, the profound teaching of Jesus, is the magnitude of God's indescribable love corresponds to the greatness of his gift. This indescribable, pure, deep, great love of God is seen in the great gift that he offered up. So the question is, what or whom did God give? Again, if you understand the spirit of Christmas, you do know that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And we do so when we're doing it God's way, truly for the benefit of the other person, but what joy we receive in the process. And sometimes we have a, a very, very costly sacrificial gift and we just can't 
wait to, to give it because we know and hope that it will be received and understood to be as an expression of love. That's why most men spend more than they should on the engagement ring for their future wife. For God so loved the world that he gave us a hundred carat diamond. Look at John 3.16. A very literal translation reads like this, For God so loved the world that His Son, the only begotten Son, He gave. The Son that is spoken of here is different than the sons that some of us have. This Son is one of a kind. He's the only begotten. This is the son who has always been. This is the son who enjoys perfect unity, harmony, and fellowship with the Father, the love relationship that exists between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before anything was but God, God, God who is love, loved. Who did God love when there wasn't even a world to love? The Father loved the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Son, loved the Father. The greatness of the gift, magnifying the measure of God's love, is seen in the fact that God gave that which was most costly and sacrificial. He didn't give anything or anyone. He gave his only begotten. He gave his monogenes son. That title, monogenes, is a striking, exalted, and somewhat peculiar term. We don't use that phraseology very often when we're talking about uh, when's the last time you said only begotten in any other context other than Jesus. What does it mean? Jesus wants us to realize that in love, God gave and sent his one of a kind, totally unique son. This is none other than the darling of heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. John 3.16 amplifies the shocking reality that in love God sent his one-of-a-kind, totally unique son. And when one studies this passage, they cannot help but think back to that story that we read of this morning, that very famous, maybe most famous and most shocking of Old Testament stories, that of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis chapter 22. You say, well, there's some parallels between what we read of and what we're very familiar with in Genesis 22, with what we read of here in John 3.16, is it coincidental and accidental? Of course not. Why in the world, speaking of why, why did God create a plan of redemption to regenerate people by His Spirit, that all who would believe in the Son who is lifted up would be saved? Why in the world would God the Father ever call Abraham His servant to sacrifice His Son? Unbelievers, religious unbelievers, smart, smart men have studied that passage. Some people have, have not believed in John 3.16 because they can't get over Genesis 22. We're too familiar with that passage. Take now your son. He doesn't just say take your son. He would have chosen if he had to. Ishmael, right? Take now your son, your only son, the son whom you love, Isaac. The miracle baby. Covenant, the one who the covenant promises would go through that son. That's the one that you're to take. And to do what? Take him to Disneyland? No, take him to a mountain that I'm going to show you and offer him up as a sacrifice. Why in the world is that in the Bible? What is that all about? We know. We know what it's about. We know there's similarities in that story between this greater work of redemption, this greater sacrifice, this greater expression of love, in that Abraham, in faith, was willing to do what God called him to do, to trust God. But God provided in that case, Abraham's son was not offered up. There was an escape plan that God had. So in place of Isaac, of course, there was a ram that was in the thicket that was offered up, a sacrifice where the Lord showed that he was mighty to provide. And in the mountain of the Lord, 
the Lord will provide for his people. So there's similarities between what Abraham was called to do and with what God chose to do in John 3.16. But there's also a striking difference. Jesus in his human nature said in the Garden of Gethsemane, contemplating the reality of, of going through with the final act of his life's mission to offer himself in the place of sinners on a shameful, scandalous cross. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But there is only one Lamb of God who could take away the sin of the world. All the lambs, even the ram in Genesis 22, was only a picture, a shadow. This is what we're talking about here. Do you question the God who is? Do you ever doubt his love? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Friends, this is why true believers love to come to church. Because we love to come to church to proclaim songs that adore and honor the love of God. Songs like, how deep the Father's love for us. How deep. It's life-changing. It's mind-boggling. It's world-altering. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. Let's be honest for a moment. Most people would struggle to sacrifice the life of a beloved household pet to save the life of an enemy. My sweet little Caesar, who my wife tolerates and I love, our little cat cowboy for an enemy? Are there any other pet lovers here? I don't think so. I don't think so. We would struggle to sacrifice the life of a pet, let alone, let alone that of a beloved child. Lord, help us to never lose our wonder at the greatness of your love. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Is it any wonder why Christians sing praise songs like this? The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. Shakespeare couldn't write a sonnet that would fully explain and extol this love, God's love. Romeo and Juliet have nothing on John 3.16. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star. It reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Friend, do you think that if we could take a, a stalk of all the people of the world, could write, if the sky was a large piece of paper, and if the ocean was the ink that we draw on, could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a, a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. We're talking about something that truly is unfathomable, unspeakable here. You will never come to Christ if you doubt or deny the love of God. Now let me talk about some of the practical ramifications. 
of but a single dimension of God's amazing love. I told you, and we've basked in the light of the nature of God's love in John 3.16. Now let's talk about some of the practical ramifications. I want to give you a few real-life scenarios to demonstrate how practical the message is. So one of the things that anyone who's preaching from the Bible is going to say often, maybe not always every week, but often is, is that God calls you, God saved you, God commissions you to be a witness, to tell people the message of John 3.16, to tell the lost world how they can be saved, to tell them that there is a way and that Jesus is the only way. When you do that, I will tell you, you will no doubt encounter somebody who will use this line of argumentation. There's different reasons, different excuses, different justifications that people will give of why they don't come to faith in Christ. Surely you will hear or have heard and will hear again somebody say, you know what? I understand what you're saying. I understand the message. You preached it well. But God could never love someone like me. Someone here may be thinking that. You think God could love me because you don't really know me. I know you don't know what keeps me up at night. You don't know what my conscience accuses me of. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. You don't know my past. God could never love someone like me. Therefore, I cannot believe the gospel you're telling me about. Now, let me give you some wise practical counsel. Do not revert, as many do, sadly, not understanding the implications of the rich, profound, and practical theology of John 3.16 to a psychobabble gospel. The problem with that person is not a low self-esteem. I hear it in all the pop songs today. I just need to learn to love me, love me, love me. That's not the problem. The problem is we love ourselves too much. And then when we don't get everything we think we deserve... Our life's a train wreck. You're saying, well, that's harsh. Well, let me, let me tell you how to say this a little bit more kindly then. You do not need to revert to the psychobabble gospel. Stick with John chapter 3. What do I mean? When somebody says, God could never save someone like me, you need to graciously yet firmly show them that what they are doing is they are belittling the power of the cross. Never? So there's something that our God can't do? He's not mighty to save? No. When someone says God could never save someone like me, they are demeaning the power of the cross and they are belittling the nature of God's boundless love. You're right. The manner of love that is necessary in order for something like this to be drawn up and executed, God sending his only son, if it were me, if I were God, thankfully I'm not, you would have real cause and reason to doubt that the gift of salvation could be offered and applied. But beloved, God is not us, thankfully. Do you not understand that God by nature is love? And God not only talks to talk, he walks to walk. He so loved, he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What that unbeliever needs to hear and receive is the message of John 3.16. Don't abandon the gospel for anything else. There is no better message. There is no other saving message. The biblical gospel is a message that extols the nature of divine love. God's love is so great and so deep that we know that it is even greater than all of our sin. John 3.16 not only moves us to the heights of worship, helps us to not lose our wonder, 
So we stand in awe of God for who he is and what he's done. It not only helps us in, in evangelism settings, but also I know that the God of the Bible is under attack in our day. How does John 3.16 help us when we're needing to defend the truth of Scripture, the tr- truth of the gospel, the truth of God? What does John 3.16 have to do with apologetics? Have you noticed that every time there's a terrible tragedy, some catastrophe, perhaps it's, humanly speaking, a man-made thing like the Jewish Holocaust, 9-11, Boston bomber. Have you noticed how unbelievers and skeptics like to throw God under the bus? Every time there's a terrible event like the coronavirus or Hurricane Katrina. Skeptics love to lob the following stick of dynamite, play a gotcha game. They ask the question, oh, Christian, how could a loving God permit such evil and suffering in the world? What are they seeking to say to you? They're not asking the question. It's rhetorical. That's why I'm not a Christian. I could never worship, serve, and love and tell others about a God like that. (laughs) May I suggest to you, before launching into a 45-minute sermon on God's absolute sovereignty, perhaps we should begin with the limitless love of God. You want proof of God's love? Please turn with me to John 3.16. For God the Father so loved the big bad world that he gave his one-of-a-kind son, so that whoever would believe in him would not perish in hell. You want what you deserve? Don't blame God for all the problems in the world. He is sovereign, but he is not the author of any evil. Don't blame the Jewish Holocaust on God. The reason why there is sin and death in the world is because of men who are sinful and who love their sin and who despise God. God didn't wait for you to run to him because if he did, he'd be waiting forever. No, God, whose love is unspeakable, so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever, what a wonderful word, whoever, God could never save someone like me, You're denying the power of the cross. You're denying the the, the depth and the nature of God's love. You don't understand it. Whoever, whoever, you're part of whoever, whoever, friend, whoever, enemy, whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I am convinced that there needs to be a resurgence in gospel-centered apologetics. Yes, you can study other arguments and defenses and all that stuff. I sometimes employ it on social media when I interact with people. But let's not lose sight of the main thing. Let's bring it back to the gospel. The gospel is the answer to all of the objections that come against God and his plan of salvation. Remind them of 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. How could a loving God permit such evil and suffering in the world? That's not the right question. The right question is, how in the world would a God who is holy and just ever choose to do this? By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God had sent his only begotten son into this world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Christ bore the full, the full weight of God's wrath God treated Jesus as if he committed the sins committed by every person who ever would believe. Isn't that remarkable? He, he drank the cup. In love, God sent his son. In love, the son came. In love, the mission was carried out until Jesus cried out from the cross, it is finished. That whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. 
So let me ask you the question that was asked so many years ago to that great theologian. Beloved, what is the greatest thought that has ever crossed through your mind? You got a lot of books on your shelf, preacher. What would you say? You sat through a lot of lectures to get all those degrees. I would just slightly edit what was said by a professor from yesteryear. What is the greatest thought that has ever passed through your mind? How about this? My maker and redeemer loves me, this I know. For his son's cradle and cross tells me so. For God so loved the world that he gave his one-of-a-kind son. Let us pray. Father, you have shown us in your word today the, the nature of your love and why you have chosen to regenerate people by your spirit to make alive those who are dead so that when Christ and the gospel is preached, that those living souls might respond in faith and be justified in your sight. Lord, your love is the theme of, of, of heaven's song. Phyllis Bishop today is in heaven because of your love and is declaring it. As is Tom Kish and all the saints that have gone before you, Abraham, Isaac. Lord, we love to Lord, help us never to lose our wonder over your love, how unique and different it is, and yet how challenging and transformative it is. It is the standard by which you call us as we drink of the fountain of your love to love others as you have loved us. Lord, it is a sanctifying message that we preach today. Lord, this message helps us in our evangelism conversations. Help us to declare well, to speak clearly and passionately, fervently of your love. And Lord, when the skeptics and mockers scoff and mock and justify their unbelief, thinking that they have us cornered, pointing to all that's wrong in this world, Lord, help us to lovingly participate in gospel-centered apologetics, to defend the faith, to always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. Lord, you are a God of perfect love, you by nature are love, and in love, you sent your Son. Oh, how we will love Jesus, because he first loved us. Thank you for this love. Help us to be a loving church. Help us to have loving marriages, loving households, families, so that people will ask how this is, so that we can point them to you. Save many, we ask, that they too might enjoy and know this love. We pray it for your glory and honor. And all God's people said, amen.